you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews chapter 1, if you uh, don't have a Bible, there should be one in front of you there in the pew. You can follow along that way. Uh, We're continuing our study we began a few weeks ago through the book of Hebrews. And I'm going to ask this question uh, for the next several weeks just to help kind of ingrain it in your mind a little bit. But can somebody help me uh, just with the main point of the book? What's the main theme of the book of Hebrews? Jesus is better, right? Jesus is greater, right? So hopefully over the next few weeks, I'll stop asking, but you'll, eventually you'll get it ingrained in your mind where you'll just remember uh, this is going to be the, the, the drum that the author of Hebrews bangs on over and over and over again. Jesus is greater. Today, uh, we're going to see that Jesus is greater than the angels. All right, so that's going to be our focus as we look at chapter 1. Lord willing, plan to finish chapter 1. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll dig into the word of God together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we bow our heads before you once more tonight, we just come with thankful hearts. Lord, the privilege to call on your name is one we do not take lightly, one which we know we can only do through Jesus Christ. Because he lived and died for us, we have a high priest who we can come boldly before your throne and find grace to help in time of need. And Lord, as we come to this time in your word, we acknowledge that we need your help. Lord, we need to hear from you. Uh, Lord, I need your help uh, to proclaim your word in truth. And so I pray that you would move by your spirit in my life and the lives of your people here this evening. I pray that the truth of your word would be just ingrained deep in our hearts. That we might know you more. We might see the glories of Christ more clearly. Lord, I pray that uh, you would do a work in us. And uh, Lord, not only as the word is proclaimed here, but out in Olympians as teachers are, uh, Lord, as they're giving their lessons and as Troy is uh, bringing your word to our teenagers tonight, we ask that your word would have a powerful effect in the lives of our young people. Lord, that they would, if need be, they would see their need of a Savior and trust in him. And for those who know you, Lord, we pray that they would grow in grace and knowledge. For each of us, Lord, we pray we become more like Christ. Lord, give us eyes to see these things tonight. We pray in Jesus' name, and amen. Uh, so the, the author of Hebrews is going to make a really strong argument here tonight. And, and so basically here's the outline. In verse 4, we see his thesis statement. All right? So this is the subject of our time together. Verses 5 through 13 is going to be his support for the statement. And then in verse 14, he's going to give us a summary. All right, so thesis statement in verse 4, support, verses 5 through 13, and then the summary in verse 14. All right, so let's look at the thesis statement here. Verse 4, chapter 1. Have, let me read chapter, verse 3 just to kind of read the full sentence. All right, we stopped in the middle. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So again, here's the statement, right? He has become much superior to the angels. He is greater than the angels, to which we would say... No kidding, right? I mean, for us, we, I, I don't think it's really an issue. Uh, in fact, I, I think if I was going to pick a passage just to preach on, if we weren't working our way through this book, I, I may not deal with this section because I don't think that there's people here tonight who are worshiping angels or holding angels to a degree that elevates them above the position of Jesus Christ. Uh, part of that is maybe cultural. We have a far different view of angels in our day than they did uh, certainly in that day. Uh, I think of the the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, right? And you have the the angel Clarence who's sent to earth, and you know, he's kind of a goofball, right? Who he always messes up, never gets things quite right, which is why he doesn't have his wings, right? And so, I mean, the, the art and entertainment in our, has really skewed our idea of what angels are. Uh, next week, uh, February 14th, Valentine's Day, guys, <laughs> same day every year, don't forget, all right? It, but you know, all, you know, we're gonna see we're gonna see these naked, chubby little babies with wings and their, you know, their quiver of, of arrows. You'll see that on cards and on cartoons and all over, right? But that's a, just again a skewed way in which we view angelic beings. 
Uh, oftentimes in our artwork, angels are pictured in a very effeminate manner. Uh, they're men in the artwork, but they don't look like men. They, they look like women. They seem to act like women. I guess there's a, uh, the idea is to express a comforting sense. Uh, but that's not the picture we see in the Scripture many times. When, you see an- when people see angels in the Scripture, they fall on their faces in fear. <laughs> they, they cower. The, the, the angel's first words in Scripture is always, <laughs> don't be afraid. Right? They're, they're an imposing being, incredible, magnificent creatures. And apparently, those who are receiving this letter held them in very high regard. Almost, you would say, maybe infatuated with angels and all of their power. You would say, well, is it really that big of an issue? Well, I think so. I mean, the, the author here starts his letter off this way. So this is a primary point, right? He's going, we've got to deal with the issue of angels as we start this thing off. And, and it's, it's good for us to understand the Jewish people had a, they had a clear view of, of how involved angels were in bringing them God's message. Right? And so it, it was, you know, if we start looking back in the Old Testament, we see that God used angels to bring his, his covenant, to bring the law to the people. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 33 says, the Lord came from Sinai from the ten thousands of holy ones with flaming fire at his right hand. Right, so Mount Sinai, we, we're familiar with that from Exodus, this time where God brings the law to his people. But the angels were present there on Sinai. And then a, a more clear picture is in the New Testament. Just listen, Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul writes, Why then the law? It was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Right? So, again, the, the Jewish people understood that this law and this covenant came through angels. And so they held them in very high esteem and high regard. And it led some of them to conclude that, you know what, this old covenant that God gave us is a, is a better covenant. Maybe we should go back to that. Right? This, this new covenant that comes with Jesus Christ it wasn't mediated by angels, right? It wasn't given to us by angels. So maybe, maybe the old covenant is superior. And so that's the, that's the argument that's happening here at the outset of the book. And the author of the Hebrews knows, right? There are those who are wanting, there are those who are wanting to, to leave Jesus and go back to their old ways. And so he's going he's gonna to present a strong case here in these first 14 verses that that Jesus Christ is greater than the angels. Right? So again, maybe not an issue for us today, uh, but it's not uncommon for us to elevate something above Jesus. Right? So even though we may not elevate angels above Jesus Christ, it's not uncommon in our life to elevate something. Right? And so it's good for us just to look here and see the argument, because the argument he's going to make that Jesus is greater than the angels Really, it holds weight no matter what you're weighing against Jesus Christ. We'll see again and again that Jesus is greater, superior to anything, anyone this world has to offer. All right, so what do we know about angels? Well, the word angel means messenger, and it appears numerous times in both the Old and the New Testament. In fact, over half of the books of the, of the Bible talk about angels. Uh, over 100 times in the Old Testament, almost 200 times in the New Testament, the word appears. Right, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a common theme. Um, what we do know when we look at those passages is that angels are, they're created beings. Right, so that, you know, angels haven't always been, they will always be, but they were created by God. We see that from John chapter 1. We see that from Colossians 1.16. Uh, you see it in the Psalms. Right, so God created angels. And, and, and so that means they're not eternal in the sense that they haven't always been like God. Right. And, and, and you know, we know that they don't multiply, they don't procreate. Jesus says they're, they're neither married nor are they given in marriage. And what that means is every single individual angel was created by God. Right. So, you know, we, you know, God made Adam and Eve, and then he said, be fruitful and multiply, and boom, we started, you know. But, but angels were made, each one, by God. Right. So there's some things that we see. You say, well, when were they created? Well, we don't really know, right? Uh, it seems like angels were most likely created before Genesis 1. 
Um, you say, well, how do you know that? Well, I, don't, I guess I don't know it for certain, but Job 38 seems to allude to this fact that the angels are present and rejoicing at the creation of the world. Right? So that, the reference is Job 38 if you want to look it up, but it seems like the angels were present before Genesis 1. So what are they like? Well, I mean, angels are certainly intelligent beings, right? They, we, we see them containing great knowledge. However, they're not omniscient, right? They don't know all things. In fact, you know, 1 Peter chapter 1 tells us they're desiring to look into the things, right? Particularly, they, they see the gospel. They see how God loves and sends his son to redeem us. And they're going, I don't know why he would do that. And I, I can relate, right? Why would God, what is man that you are mindful of us? Right? But they, they don't know God's plan and God's timeline, right? These things are only known by the fathers. They don't know all things, but they are certainly intelligent beings. They are also, um, we see here in our passage in Hebrews 1, they're, they're spirit beings, right? So verse, it says, are they not all ministering spirits? So they don't have flesh and bone, right? But they are contained by space, right? So angels are not omnipresent, they're not, able to, they're not like God in that sense that they can be everywhere all at once. Right? Now, we do see angels appear in human form many times in the Scripture. So they're able to take on human form. In fact, at the end of this book, we'll see it says sometimes we are entertaining angels unawares. Right? So it's possible for us to encounter angels and not even know that we've encountered angels. Uh, we see them appear in dreams and visions, oftentimes appearing... Um, you know, appearing in a human form. I, I got lots of questions this afternoon from people, and you may have lots of questions, and I can't answer all of them. But, um, you know, one of the questions has come up, well, are there female angels? And in the Scripture, we never, ever see angels in a female form. Uh, always, always appear. And the names that are given of angels are in the masculine, right? Michael and Gabriel and Lucifer are the names that we know of that are angelic names. Uh, and, and so... Some people argue that angels are neither male nor female, that they're that what they call would ne- they're neuter. Right? All I know is when you find them in the scripture, they appear to be male. And, and, and so I don't believe there are female angels. But you say, well, do you know that? No, I don't know that. <laughs> it's just what we see in the scripture, okay? All right, so they're not omnipresent, but they are extremely powerful. Not all powerful, but very powerful. All right, so... What we find when we look at the Word of God is they're able to do some incredible things, right? In Genesis 19, you see angels absolutely wipe out the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, just level them, right? And in 2 Kings chapter 19, one angel, one angel slaughters the entire Assyrian army, right? 185,000 soldiers, one angel, right? And that's, that's massive strength, right? Massive power. Uh, in, Re- in the book of Revelation, we see they're able to control both the wind and the seas. Right? So, you know, they have incredible power, but they're not all powerful, right? They have to submit to, to God. They can never do anything outside of his will, outside of his plan. So even though they have great power, they're always submissive to the will of the Father. Um, how many angels are there? <laughs> A lot, right? <laughs> Uh, the, you know, the, the scriptures say 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. And, and, and that, that's really the answer is there's a bunch of angels. I would say this, if you really have to be exact, right, there's exactly enough. <laughs> right? <laughs> there, there, there's the right amount of angels, right? God has made, and they have different roles and different ranks. Um, we see them playing, you know, see them uh, guarding the glory of God around the throne. And then others are over nations and over you know, we, we see different roles. We don't have time to look at all those, but their primary role is to worship God and to serve Him. Um, Psalm 103, uh, if you want to turn, you can, but I'm going to read it. Psalm 103, verses 20 and 21. It just says this, Bless the Lord, O you His angels, you mighty ones who do His word, obeying the voice of His word, Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, his ministers who do his will. All right, so what we see here is these mighty angelic creatures, they what? They do the word of God, they hear the voice of God, they do the will of God. And this is always true. 
right? So angels do not go outside of God's plan. Um, now, we're not talking about fallen angels, okay? So that's another time, that's, that's another time altogether. But uh, pretty impressive stuff. And we begin to understand why these people had such an elevated view of angelic beings, right? They're powerful. They're incredible. And, and what had taken place now in the church is it bordered on, on, on worship itself. They had started to elevate angels to a place where they worship them. And any time we find in the scripture where an angel is worshipped, what do they do? Stop it, right? I mean, people would fall. He says, don't worship me. Worship God. Right? And, and so we understand right, this, that kind of worship is a violation of God's law. Right? That we're not to worship anything but God. And that, that brings right to our point that we want to focus on tonight. Right? Who is Jesus Christ? According to the author of Hebrews, he is much greater than the angel. Right? So to support that, what he's going to do is he's going to give us seven Old Testament passages here. And I think that's important. Because right? some people like to just take the Old Testament and just throw it out. Right? Well, the Old Testament, it, it's full of allusions to who Jesus is. Right? So from beginning to end, the scriptures are constantly revealing to us the person of Jesus Christ. And so here, they don't have the New Testament yet. But the author of Hebrews is looking at these Old Testament passages and go, this is true of Jesus, and this is true of Jesus, and this is not true of the angels. Right? And so that's what he's going to do. Right? He's just going to give us this contrast. And, and, and we see an author who loves Jesus, but we see an author who also loves the Word. And what I particularly like is he doesn't just, he doesn't just give his opinion. Right? Whenever we're, we're asking questions or we're giving answers, right? we don't want to just say, right, I think this or I believe this. Or we want to say what? This is what God has said in his Word. Right? And so that's what our author is going to do. He's just going to take the Old Testament and he's going to say, Thus says the Lord. All right, so we're going to look at that together. Let's just remind you of verse 4 again, right? Becoming more superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. And we need to deal with the language just for a moment. Because it says, having become much superior to angels. The KJV actually says he has been made more superior to the angels. And you know, cults, false teachers, particularly Jehovah's Witnesses, love to run to this section of Scripture and say, do you see that? Right? Jesus Christ is a created being. Right? He was made. He became. Well, the, the, the translation for made there is not a good translation of the Greek word. Right? It, it became is a much better translation that we have here in the ESV. But even then, it raises questions. Right? Did Jesus Christ become something other than he was? And the answer is, of course he did, right? I mean, he became a man, right? Look over at uh, verse 9 of chapter 2. It says, But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For a time, Jesus was made lower than the angels, but in his life, death, burial, and resurrection, he is restored to this glorified state. And so he says here, he became much greater than the angels by his salvific work on the cross, by his death, burial, and resurrection. Right? This is what we find in, in Romans chapter 1 when the Apostle Paul talks about the resurrection. Right? Jesus Christ is elevated in status. Now, he's always been, right? always been God, always, but this is him fulfilling the purpose of God. Right? And so we see that here. So what is this name that is much more excellent. You know, Jesus Christ is given a name that's more excellent than the angels. Well, the name, that, at least in the context here, is the name Son. Right? Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Right? And, and you say, well, what's the contrast? Well, the contrast, angels means messenger. Right? A messenger, a servant of God. Well, certainly the Son of God is greater than the servant of God, right? They hold a different position, right? So verse, in, in each one of these, again, quoting from the Old Testament, so verse 5 says, for to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you. That's Psalm 2, verse 7. Or again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. That's 2 Samuel seven fourteen. Right, so to which of the angels did God ever say? It's a rhetorical question. 
And the answer is, the expected response, none, right? To no angel ever did God say this. God never said to an angel, you are my son. There are times in the Old Testament where, right, God refers to angels collectively as sons of God, right, in a sense of their role. But never does he identify an angel as the son of God, right? So this is an exalted title, and this is the way in which Jesus has eternally related to God. So when it says there, today I have begotten you, again, it doesn't have the idea of being born or being made, but it's just describing the relationship between the triune God. Right? God has always been the Father. Jesus has always been the Son. And this is the way they relate to one another. And if you want me to explain, explain the Trinity, you're, I can't. Right? <laughs> My mind can't wrap all the way around. But we believe it, right? Three distinct persons, one God. Right? This is what we find in the Scripture. All right, so... Jesus is the son, but then we see in verse 6, again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. So not only is Jesus the son, but Jesus is the exalted son. He's quoting here from Psalm 97, 7. Some think it's Deuteronomy 32. Not a huge deal, which one, but... Again, right, this language can be troublesome, right? The false teachers love to run here, right? He brings his firstborn into the world. Right? Now, firstborn there can mean firstborn chronologically, right? This is, you know, my daughter Katie is my firstborn, right? She was my first child. But it also can mean first in position or first in rank. And, and the best illustration I can give you of that is, is to go back to the Old Testament and Jacob and Esau. Right. So Esau was the firstborn chronologically. But the firstborn by rank, the heir was Jacob. Right? And, and so this is the sense in which it's used of Jesus Christ. It's not talking about the first created being. It's talking about what? The one who is preeminent. The first in position over all of creation. And that is Jesus Christ. Right? So that's the picture here. The exalted son. Right? He's not the first created thing. He is the creator over all things. And so it's kind of unclear in, in our section here whether he's talking about, it says when he brings him into the world, whether it's talking about his first coming or his second coming. And theologians love to kind of argue back and forth. And the truth is, it doesn't really matter. Right? The point is what? When he comes, the angels worship him. Right? And so if the angels are worshiping Jesus, then he certainly is superior to them. That's the argument. That's the point. So the exalted son is worshipped by the angels. And this is really what sets Christianity apart from all other religions. You know, Jesus is often given a high place. Um, you know, people, great respect by Jews, by Muslims, even by atheists, right? They'll consider him a great teacher, uh, you know, a, a good example but not to be worshipped, not God. Right? But this is what sets Christianity apart, right? It's not enough just to hold Jesus in high regard. He is to be worshipped as God. <laughs> and so that's what we find the angels doing here. The angels are worshipping Jesus Christ because he is greater. And then we have a contrast, right, of the angels, he says. So he says, to which of the angels did he say? But he says, this is what he says about the angels. Psalm 104.4 he makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire. Now, the picture here is real clear, right? The psalmist just says, the angels, they do what God says, right? They, they're as swift as the wind. They're as quick as lightning in God's service. They do his bidding without hesitation, right? <laughs> it's, there's a contrast here, right? So this is what the angels are, right? They are quick to do God's will, quick to obey his word. Psalm 45, 6, and 7 is what is quoted there in verses 8 through 10, or 8 and 9, I'm sorry. But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. So the angels are servants, but the son is the sovereign king. 
right? He's the one who is ruling and reigning here. So we see Jesus Christ as the eternal king over all things, right? So this throne is Jesus' throne, and the angels are obeying him. You know, we said one of the primary roles the, of the angels is to worship. And, 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 and one of those passages that has always stood out to me over the years is Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah 6, the angels are gathered around the throne of God, and they're just, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Well, in John chapter 12, the one on the throne is identified as Jesus Christ. Pre-incarnate, but Jesus nonetheless, and they are worshiping him as God, right? He is the king. He is the ruler. And I think it's fair to ask tonight, do you relate to Jesus as king? You know, is he Lord of your life? You know, it's often been said he's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Right? So, it, you know, isn't it incredible? When you look at the scripture, everything obeys Jesus. Right? When Jesus was on the earth, right, the wind and the waves obeyed his voice. The, d- the demons fled at his command. And yet we often disobey. We're the only things in creation. <laughs> it's incredible. Right. And, and so we have this picture here of the eternal king who rules and reigns. And then in verses 10 and 11, the psalmist is going to quote, I'm sorry, the, the author is going to quote Psalm 102, verses 25 through 27. He says, You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. Like a robe, you will roll them up. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will have no end. Now, what's incredible is Psalm 102 is just worshiping God as the creator. And what the the author of Hebrews does is he takes this passage from the Psalms that's talking about God, about Yahweh, right, the great I am that I am, and he just unashamedly attaches it to Jesus. What does he do there? He's identifying Jesus Christ as God, right? So Jesus here is the eternal creator right he's the one who made all things he's the beginning of all things it's just tying us back to verse two that we looked at last week he is the beginning of everything he's the creator of not a created being like the angels but a creator of all things right so significant there and then his last his last quote is psalm 110 in verse 13 in fact this psalm or that particular verse is quoted in the new testament more than any other jesus quotes it himself Right, but he says this, to which of the angels has he ever said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? And so we have, again, rhetorical question. To which of the angels did he ever say? The answer is none. Right? To no one, to no angel ever did he say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. What's he saying here? Ultimately, right, everything in the universe is subject to Jesus. Right? Every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is not only the beginning of all things, but he is the end of all things. Right? That's the point. Right? The point here is that in God's plan, Jesus Christ is destined to rule over the universe and everything in it. <laughs> and the contrast here is powerful. Right? So the summary verse, verse 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation. What are the angels? They are servants. All angels. Gabriel, Michael, without exception, sent by God as servants to who? To God, yes. Yes. But to God's, those who are to inherit salvation. So, right, to us. They serve us. Now, we don't, beckon and call them and command them but they are at god's command to serve his people that's incredible is it not and who's doing the commanding jesus christ the one who's sitting on the throne right so let me ask you this why in the world would you ever worship anything or anyone else but jesus right what we have in here is a picture of Jesus as the Son of God, the exalted Son, the eternal King, right? The, the creator of all things, the end of all things. There's no one like him. We told you, the author of Hebrews loves Jesus, and he wants you to love Jesus. And he's going to paint this picture 
for us. And I know there's a lot of technical, right? I mean, we spend a lot of time looking at Old Testament verses and trying to explain some of these things, and you might just kind of be sitting here tonight going, what, what do I do with this? You know, how do I apply this? I mean, all this talk about angels, and, you know, what's the application? Well, there's a few things we can take away from it tonight. Number one, we see God's incredible care for his people. <laughs> I mean, these amazing, powerful creatures are at God's command for our sake. Stop to think about that for a moment. Psalm 91 one, or 11 says this, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. Now, I don't believe that we have individual guardian angels. You know, some of you are going to be upset by that. But you know, there's myriads and myriads and thousands upon thousands. I don't think God assigns each one of us an angel. But I do believe that these angels are at his command at any moment. And, and I believe that he uses them at times to protect his people. You know, one of the clearest pictures is in 2 Kings chapter 6. Uh, we're not going to turn there, but you know, there, there's this moment where the Assyrian army is surrounding the city. And Elisha, he, Elisha gets up in the morning and his servant goes, what are we going to do? We're surrounded. And Elisha says, well, we got more than they got. <laughs> and the servant's just like, are you nuts? <laughs> you know, we're surrounded. And he goes, Lord, let him see. And, and God opens the servant's eyes and he sees the flaming chariots surrounding the Assyrian army. And, 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 and his eyes are open and he, and he sees something that we don't get to see. Right? These, these angelic beings are everywhere <laughs> at God's command. I, I read a, a missionary account, uh, John Patton, uh, just a, a Scottish missionary to the New Hebrides, just a, a wonderful man of God who took the gospel. But there was a time early in their ministry where they were being attacked by tribesmen. There was a whole, <laughs> a whole group that was coming to their house to kill them. And, and, and this, they could hear them coming. And so him and his wife just kneel in their house in prayer. And uh, they're saying, Lord, you know, we have nowhere to go. You have, you have to save us. And so they're praying all night long. They can hear the, the tribesmen outside ready to kill them. And, and as morning dawns, they're gone. And they just get up, they look out, and they're like, there, there's nobody there. And a year later, one of the men of that tribe who was attacking their home got saved. And so Patton just asked him, what, what happened that night? And he goes, who were all of those men with you? <laughs> you had men in white surrounding your house. And, and we, we fled. <laughs> there were more of them than there were of us. Well, Patton knew, right? It was, it was God's angels protecting him. You say, do you really believe that? I do. In fact, we hear in many accounts of missionary stories where God does similar things. Yeah. God is able. I, I think we would be shocked if, if our eyes were opened and we could see the spiritual. You know, we could see, I, I think we'd be amazed. Uh, both On both sides, right? I mean, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. But God's angelic beings are active in accomplishing his purpose. And many times that's to guide, to guard, protect his people. You know, the other thing that stands out to me, as we see this, this powerful picture of the Son, right? Jesus Christ as the Son of God. But what are we told? John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his, his Son. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Right? This exalted son, this eternal king, left heaven and came to earth and lived as a man and died for our sin. Romans 8.32 says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? We should marvel at God's care, but we should marvel at God's love. That he would send his son to die for us. And the last thing I would say in application, right? These are people who they know who Jesus is, but they're tempted to leave. They're tempted to turn away from Christianity and turn back to their old ways. And, and here, the author of the Hebrews is saying, look at verse 2, the first verse there. Therefore, we must pay closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. He's trying to pull them back and say, put your eyes firmly on Jesus Christ. 
And it's really leading up to this point where he's saying, you can have full assurance, full confidence, complete faith in who Jesus is. Look at verse, or chapter 4, verse 14. We'll close with this. Chapter 4, verse 14. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. He's saying this, you can trust Jesus. Right? Regardless of what you're facing, regardless of the trials and temptations that you're going through, he says what? Have confidence. Hold fast to Jesus Christ. He will never fail you. And that's a good place to finish. Let's close in prayer.